You know, we have children as young as four mining coltan in the Congo so that everyone can have an iPhone. And we're only talking about, well, what can people who are being exploited and oppressed do? Rather than questioning, why is it people at this end continuing to need to have such high energy demands? So when we think about who created the problem, it is not the people who are paying the biggest price. I shouldn't think that I can just run in and fix somebody else's problem, right? Instead of first figuring out what are the ways am I complicit in upholding or participating in or being enrolled in climate coloniality. So decolonizing means uh, dismantling not only exploitative systems, but addressing both those material and epistemic elements of climate coloniality. Hello everyone and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast where we have in-depth discussions with researchers to better understand the metabolism of our societies and how to reduce their socio-ecological impact in a systemic, socially just and context-specific way. And today we will explore the topic of climate colonialism. While the catastrophic effects of climate change are now well understood, its connections with colonialism are at best overlooked. On top of that, most of the solutions promoted by the Global North, such as carbon offsetting, renewable energy production or reforestation, could constitute yet another form of green colonialism, exploiting once again the land and people of the Global South. To help us navigate through these questions, I have the great pleasure to welcome Professor Arhana Sultana. Arhana is Professor of Geography and the Environment at Syracuse University in the US and Visiting Faculty Fellow at the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. Her research focuses on the links between climate justice, water governance, international development and anti-colonial politics. With all that being said, Farhana, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me to the podcast to talk about my book. I appreciate it. Yes, this great book came out, Confronting Climate Coloniality, Decolonizing Pathways for Climate Justice. As I mentioned at the beginning, everybody kind of agrees in the climate discourse today, but perhaps this way of describing it is incomplete or misleading. What is incomplete in the mainstream way of presenting the climate change? All right. Um, so we know that uh, climate change is a risk and threat multiplier. And it does create this unevenness, right, in terms of unjust impacts, more intense, frequent, unpredictable uh, climate-related disasters, such as floods, droughts, um, storms, sea level rise, and so forth. So the way we understand climate change right now and in terms of what it does, uh, what it means, it comes from a very physical science um, framing, and that has limited the way people talk about climate change. So climate coloniality, uh, I believe, is a critical framework that helps us understand the climate crisis in terms of thinking about those um, how the contemporary climate crisis and the related socio-ecological impacts are very much entangled with colonial legacies. So the contemporary climate crisis is, is a product of uh, that those persistent structural inequalities rooted in colonial histories and practices, which shape who suffered the most from climate change. But then also, in, it's a way that those persistent inequalities in framings influence what can be known about climate change and what should be done about climate crises. So we know that these legacies of imperial violence insidiously live on uh, in terms of uh, exacerbating environmental degradations, increasing greenhouse gas emissions, um, also the technocratic solutionism that is pursued. So what climate coloniality does is it helps us understand the coloniality, which is the matrix of power from colonial and imperial times that persist in subtle and overt ways in understanding global climate politics, but also local climate responses. So who bears this uneven burden? How do they respond? Why do we have certain forms of persistent injustices? But also in terms of what are the ways that ongoing from the past centuries, those colonial exploitation and racial capitalism continue to dominate global climate governance uh, in terms of policymaking, framing, 
practices in terms of pursuing certain forms of mitigation or adaptation and how that therefore often re um, inscribes or exacerbates uh, new for uh, already marginalized communities and then adds new forms of marginalization to uh, in very disproportionate ways onto those who have produced the least amount of climate gases. So when we think about who created the problem, it is not the people who are paying the biggest price. So there's this real um, injustice therein, in terms of not only have they not contributed to creating the problem, but they have been part of uh, the silencing and then also bearing the burden of the ongoing impacts of the problem, uh, but then also trying to find solutions of the problem where we also see these forms. Um, and you mentioned, for instance, carbon offset programs, so those are one of them, uh, but then also in terms of ongoing resource extraction, uh, in terms of production of sacrifice zones, and so on. Why do you think these problems are so persistent as well? Because it's been 10 or many years that we have been identifying the problem, yet identifying the problem is not really a, a path forward or enough of a path forward. Um, I agree. So the IPCC came out very forcefully in its um, WG, um, this, the two, the Working Group 2's sixth report in 2022, so about two years ago. They were quite um, vocal in identifying those roots, but in terms of, you know, why is it that we've identified, research has uh, mentioned it, but what, what can be done or why is nothing being done? I think, guess that's your question. So in, in our book, we try to address that in terms of why is not enough being done if we've identified the problem. So this is where the term coloniality um, helps us understand beyond colonialism. So it's how the persistence of the impacts of colonialism that outlive formal colonization. Right. So in terms of uh, when we think about power imbalances globally, geopolitical relations, who is still at the top in terms of not just material wealth, but in terms of influence and um, those uneven power relations that, um, that I mentioned earlier. So the reason why even identifying the problem doesn't necessarily result in um, an immediate solution is because there's a lot of resistance to um, you know, having anything be done because it challenges existing entrenched power systems that have arisen from 500 years of both European colonization, but then also American imperialism. And that is a form of uh, worry that about losing power, but also losing material access in terms of having those forms of say in what gets done, or what solutions are pursued, but also in terms of identification of the problem. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you know, which is an international body of scientists who have identified this, which is based on research, so it's indisputable. So what we try to do in our book is um, really push forward that yes, these are problems, Often they're not even talked about. Uh, they're not addressed, certainly. Now people are beginning to talk about them more openly in the public. So it has to go from uh, the realm of research and publications. So the IPCC as an international policy body picked up on it. And now maybe governments might talk about it and it is uh, spreading into, um, you know, non-governmental, non-profit spaces, activist spaces uh, and uh, educational spaces and everyday media, perhaps, that we haven't quite arrived at that yet. So when we think about uh, the persistence, and this, we have to understand that the matrix of power that persists from the past into the present means that we, it, it is incredibly hard to, um, you know, figure out what can we do in terms of a quick fix. I don't think there is a quick fix. Uh, it requires a certain understanding that these are not about haves and have nots, which is the way the world has operated for a long time. But in terms of those dynamics, 
come back in terms of chickens coming home to roost. So because climate change is that threat multiplier, it is spreading, although it historically impacted what is uh, euphemistically known as the global south or post-colonial countries, but also indigenous spaces and settler colonial countries, uh, racialized communities within the so-called global north or advanced industrialized countries, we need to understand that they may be paying the price longer, it, but they will not be the only ones. That increasingly more and more people will get impacted, as we saw recently with uh, the flooding in Valencia, Spain, just a couple of days ago, or the wildfires in California, uh, in terms of the orange skies in New York uh, a year and a half ago. So more and more people are waking up to realizing that uh, these forms of not thwarting climate coloniality ends up harming more and more people. What is the new form of colonialism? Because historic uh, colonialism was more resource plundering, um, slavery, um, exploitation of land and all of this. But there's going to be new forms of that. Can you perhaps explain in, because as a geographer, we, we always work in, in layers, uh, in layers of time and, and of space. How do you see the, the future of the potential threat in different spaces? Where do you see also water governance coming into all of this? All right. So in terms of thinking about that kind of scalar and spatial dimension, so climate apartheid is one of the concepts that helps us understand that in terms of that spatial demarcation of those who have experienced uh, climate impacts the longest and those who are protected for some time. It's often the wealthy and the elite whose um, hyperconsumption right now is maintaining it but also in terms of the impacts that are being felt in other spaces. So what we often say is these are going to lead to the creation of more sacrifice zones. And these are um, spaces of intensifying you know, um, environmental harm and therefore uh, public health harm, but also in terms of inequities. And these often impact poor nations and communities most dram dramatically. And these sacrifice zones, uh, which are also spatially and temporally demarcated, uh, they have roots in those colonial times, for instance, where plantation ecologies existed and they exist even now in terms of large agribusinesses. We're seeing these systemic inequities uh, limit political representation and perpetuate those cycles of environmental um, injustice and health uh, disparities. Uh, one of the issues that has come up is in terms of land grabs, but also water grabs. So land, gra land usually comes with some form of water, whether it's groundwater or surface water. So right now we do see water security as an important component, because when you think about it, and I say this to my students all the time, that climate change is water change. It's effectively too much, too little, wrong time, wrong place, wrong type, right? So too much meaning flood too little drought, wrong place, meaning, you know, flash floods, like high amounts of precipitation or a storm. So when we think about the fact that these are about those kinds of uh, disruptions in the hydrological cycle in terms of desiccation of the soil, uh, of species, of displacement of ecosystems, but then also the resilience of ecosystems being thwarted. So they're not being able to... Um, adapt and grow back uh, with the same biological uh, diversity or robustness. At the same time, we're seeing that wealthier and elite are able to capture more of the water and the land and other ecological resources necessary for life and kind of maintain uh, that on that climate coloniality in terms of uh, accumulation of wealth through exploitation, through environmental degradation. And as a result, those kind of um, issues around those neocolonial mechanisms that maintain global trade systems, development policies, climate governance uh, systems, for instance, uh, you know, how do we make policies around what gets financed, what is considered loss and damage, or what kind of mitigation should happen? Those are the things that are maintaining climate coloniality. And they are also the systems where people find loopholes to um, exploit uh, further what I call climate solutionism, which includes things like land and water grabs, 
uh, forest deforestation, increasing sacrifice zones, that spatial demarcation of climate apartheid. And, as, uh, we, and these have dire consequences and they will raise further vulnerability of communities that are not only grappling with um, legacies of harm, but then also new forms of ecological and climate devastations, which will increase uh, their vulnerability uh, to these disasters, but then also reduce their coping skills and their adaptive capacity to be able to bounce back, to have, uh, you know, flourishing lives in the future. We, we need to fight back somehow, or we need to act somehow. Um, in your book, you use the term confronting um, because it has several meanings that you engage with. And you also talk about decolonizing pathways. As we mentioned before, it's not only important to recognize the problem, but also working towards justice, reparations, and restitution, as you write here. Could you explain how do we confront climate coloniality in practice? Sure. So the uh, title of the book is Confronting Climate Coloniality. And the reason why the word confronting uh, kept coming up to me over years of working on this, uh, grappling with what it means, what it, what is being done, and then um, thinking through the different kinds of evidence that exists is that people are confronting these kinds of problematic policies, solutions, laws, regulations. Uh, they're also fighting back. So confronting could be to, uh, you know, to literally the way we often think about it in terms of facing something, but it can also means enduring, means that persistence, right? That, that continuation and that uh, not, so therefore not being able to overcome it, but then figuring out what are the ways that you can work with it. So when we think about um, recognizing and addressing uh, these issues around uh, climate coloniality, we have to recognize the embedded structures in global policies, in economic systems, in environmental governance, and in educational systems. So that when we talk about, when I talk about decolonizing pathways away from that ongoing, persistent climate coloniality that relies on a certain form of legacies, right? But that legacy is also not only material, but also discursive in terms of knowledge production, in terms of the educational system. What do we know about climate change? How do we teach it? How do we talk about it? So decolonizing means uh, dismantling not only exploitative systems, but addressing both those material and epistemic elements of climate coloniality. And uh, you uh, touch upon some of them and you know I can elaborate a little bit more. So when we think about, for instance, the material aspects of climate coloniality and how do we decolonize it, what does it look like, or what does confronting it look like? So when we think about, um, you know, how climate coloniality persists through governance, through policies, through markets, we can think about like what are, how do those tools allow us to address uh, more reparative relationships? So part of that could mean financial transfer or debt cancellation because countries of the global south or post-colonial countries have been paying off their uh, debt for a long time, whether it's, you know, Haiti to France because they dared to become independent or because of countries having taken out development or international development loans to help build their countries once they were formally uh, left alone, formally became independent nation states. As a result, you know, debt cancellation is one part of, uh, some people see it as a part of climate reparations, in it, but it's also more than that. It's about having these kinds of uh, discussions, thinking about what does this, uh, you know, um, aid adaptation look like? Uh, what is uh, the good life? What are the ways we can think about infrastructure, technology, uh, uh, who's uh, even making these rules? Another way to also think about it is in terms of sovereignty and self-determination. So when we amplify indigenous and marginalized community voices in environmental decision making, we do not only help the world recognize the pluriversal knowledges and systems that have been um, silenced or eroded, but also that form of self-determination can um, result uh, from local populations having autonomy over natural resources. 
and adaptation practices. So it is not all externally driven, uh, not all controlled by imperial forces and geopolitical power grabs. So we can talk about in terms of, um, you know, how different groups come together uh, to influence uh, the COP, which is coming up, COP29, or the Conference of Parties, so the world's largest uh, climate conference annually. So COP29 will be another site where these discussions come up. Uh, you know, uh, they're very contentious, obviously. But what they also demonstrate is another aspect, like in terms of material decolonization, and that's that transnational solidarity. We can combat these colonial practices and advocate for systems change by linking across the globe. Uh, we've seen building alliances, whether it's um, you know indigenous environmental networks, Fridays for Future, which is the youth climate um, activism, but then also in terms of thinking about um, fighting, let's say, fossil fuel extraction, uh, fighting deforestation, dispossession of land, uh, making connections between uh, fossil fuel industry and warfare and imperial power maintenance uh, in terms of who gets to have a say in global um, concerns, but at the same time, recognizing that we can dismantle uh, these uh, issues. So that's you know just some examples of material. One of the um, uh, important related part that I talk about is discursive or epistemic decolonization. And what I mean by that is that uh, climate crisis and its related ecological degradation isn't just causing um, losses and damages in terms of material, cultural, ecological, or economic um, aspects, but also in terms of knowledge production. Like, how do we know about these problems? If we didn't include more Global South, more marginal population, more indigenous communities, we wouldn't know that colonialism existed, is ongoing. There's this persistent inequity, right? So when we think about epistemic decolonization, it is about redressing epistemic injustice, which means that how certain voices and knowledge systems were systematically devalued and excluded or during active colonization and, and into the post-colonial times or ongoing coloniality. And as a result, who is heeded, who is heard, who is even invited to be a decision maker, a policy maker, or have influence in terms of trajectory of funding of mit on mitigation or adaptation, um, or in terms of what gets to count as scientific knowledge. So what we've seen is that um, the epistemic injustice has resulted in dis discussions around climate change to result in not only that marginalization of indigenous and um, uh, local people's voices, but also a certain kind of bias, uh, of, of favor in terms of knowledge that's uh, technical, uh, in terms of knowledge that comes from experts or elites, so not uh, everyday people, uh, in terms of uh, knowledge that marginalizes and silences indigenous voices, uh, racialized community voices, but also how the solutions that are proffered are very market-based, that are often very technocratic, technological, and they neglect other forms of climate uh, justice, for instance, community-based or rights-based. And so when we think about these epistemic decolonization, it is entirely about knowledge. And this then comes to, um, in terms of dom uh, the dominance of Eurocentric narratives that have become universalized. And decolonizing means to show that it is not universal that there are other ways of knowing and being in the world that we can learn from, that we should, that should be elevated. So we need to decenter those kind of Eurocentric or Western scientific universalizing paradigms uh, and try to understand uh, the different kinds of environmental and place-based knowledge being produced by those who have actually been enduring climate coloniality for a very long time. So those are, you know, two ways to think about, uh, for instance, what does it mean to decolonize? It means to re reveal, reassess, and dismantle, but it also means looking at those everyday tactics of fighting of, of oppression.
uh, and then those who have power uh, trying to work with those who do not to change and subvert the system because the system is incredibly sedimented and that sedimentation means that we are continuing in this trajectory, which means we will pass the point of no return with further greenhouse gas emissions and further runaway climate breakdown, further exploitative governance policy and legal instruments, which then increase more suffering of larger numbers of people and also ecosystems alongside it. Of course, yes. Thanks so much for putting them into these two uh, parts, as you mentioned, the material and political on the one side and then discursive and epistemological on the other side. And of course, in the book, you also write, there is no single blueprint to decolonize climate as decolonization is a process and not an event. In a material perspective, we can always talk about agroecological sovereignty, energy sufficiency, anti-capitalist development as well. So these are, let's say, big traits that we can find everywhere. But then when we go to the contextualization of it, I'm wondering where does knowledge uh, production fit in into that? How do we produce decolonized knowledge? Absolutely. So to decolonize for going forward, it is about that co-production of knowledge. It is also about changing, for instance, curriculum. What do we teach? How do we teach it? Why are certain kinds of texts valued or certain forms of um, knowledge production centered in the classroom. So we can try to co-produce knowledge with communities when, we, when we're researchers and scientists, but those of us who are also educators or worry about pedagogy, we can think about like how do we shift and use more decolonial methodologies, uh, different types of knowledge systems in the classroom, in terms of what is known, because a lot of our students come to university and then they learn about climate justice. They've been aware of it maybe in school, but they haven't really thought about it beyond, uh, let's say, um, let's just go and do a you know carbon offsetting program or let's just go and fix this well. Yes, those are certain kinds of technological fixes, but they can also lead to wider, um, long-standing concerns. So when we want to think about um, local initiatives, part of that is to, or is collectivizing. So that solidarity building, that line you just read out a little while ago, is in terms of it is not as uh, no single person can do it. There's no one blueprint. And I try to, when I wrote that, I tried to elaborate on what that meant in terms of if we do not have those kinds of self-reflexivity to recognize that our knowledge is limited, it is partial, at the and that there are other forms of knowledge that might help us understand things better. So if we, for instance, think about um, those agricultural land grabs in Africa, or in terms of why there's so much the emphasis on, you know, um, disaster recovery in certain countries, but not in others. So there's that dis disparity in recovery funding, uh, but also at the same time, how, for instance, um, communities are talking about climate, we can start to figure out how do we have a more holistic approach so that we can combat the ongoing forms of technocratic, universalizing, only market-based solutions. And then also the way people are portrayed People are portrayed in entire, in, in very kind of racialized ways, uh, in the global south, but also as be, uh, infantilized, which is that coloniality ongoing. That's the way people are portrayed in the past as being helpless, as not having knowledge, not knowing what to do. So it is about kind of being self reflexive of these issues. And those of us who have relational privilege to deploy that relational privilege to elevate other voices and hear them and heed them, but then also to work with in more collaborative uh, solidarity-based praxis. And sometimes we can see that in the form of mutual aid. We can see that in forms of ways of sharing knowledge, not just in terms of coming together in, in a particular place, but you can come together now virtually and digitally. You can come together through text, so what is written, what is learned, what is read, what are you reading? So this brings me back to um, the curriculum. Uh, 
but also in terms of discursive framing. So the fact that we're having this conversation now uh, may not have been possible like 50 years ago. So in terms of expanding um, our own sense of understanding of what is a scientific problem. So as researchers and scholars, but then also maybe there are you know, policymakers and decision makers who are um, here today, what are the ways we have come to um, design a solution or in terms of what is the best depends on how we have defined the problem. So if our problem framing is limited, then our uh, solution or the way we see our path forward is going to be constrained. So what the book tries to do is identify and point out all the different ways that this exists in the world and, and then how can we um, move forward from that. I, I think at a local level, it's already hard, but when we think about challenges at a global level, at a polycentric governance level, let's say, I find things even harder to address wicked problems. It's going to be a green colonialism if we're not putting uh, sufficient attention to how we frame the problem. So I'm wondering, how do you think we frame this problem where we know we're going to need some renewable energy, but how do we put the ones that are the most affected at the forefront. So in terms of energy transition, you're right, that is uh, at the forefront of uh, many people's minds. And when we think about the fact that incorporating local voices has historically not been done very well, so there aren't many uh, you know, widely known uh, instances of global governance or corporations listening to the people that are impacting uh, badly. When we think about those kinds of um, why this con continues, but what it could look like, I think we can take um, examples from around the world where people have come together to collectivize, to have a voice, to fight back against uh, oppression. For instance, if we think back to um, the, you mentioned water, which is my trajectory having come from, you know, combining water and climate research to understand the world better. So one of the largest water, um, often called the water war, uh, is in Cochabamba, Bolivia in over 20 years ago. And it was basically how a corporation was given the uh, contract to privatize water sources and that increased the price of uh, the tariff of water. The hike was so extensive that poor people could not afford tap water anymore. So this led to people collectivizing. So you had workers and students and teachers and, uh, you know, uh, everyday people on the streets and then fighting and protesting. And then the army was rolled out. So we do see instances where local people have tried to make their voice known and there's been violence. But we can also learn from that. And from there, it, it was a cautionary tale for privatization of water. And we're seeing that with the energy sector in terms of privatization of energy uh, sources, but also like, let's say, lithium mines, uh, to, which are necessary for electric vehicles, for electrification of solar panels. So we need uh, rare earth minerals. Where is that coming from? Which communities are they benefiting at all? You know, we have children as young as four mining coltan in the Congo so that everyone can have an iPhone. These are the conversations that are not being had. We see this disconnect between consumption and hyperconsumption, and then the people at the production side who are paying the price, so labor, ecology, but also epistemic knowledge, and then the erasure and then the death of that. And I think when local people try to come together, they, are of, they often do not always have a voice because they are often met with violence, either by the corporation or by their own government or by a combination of the two. So this is where that collectivizing comes in. So it is about recognizing these exist, see, you know, threading the needle that these are all connected, um, and then bringing it to these spaces where these kinds of people can be made to be aware of this, that this is not a one-off. And as a result, there has to be greater accountability, there has to be transparency, there has to be forms of justice on the ground in terms of reparations, uh, because they cannot continue to be sacrifice zones, right? So whether that is compensation, whether that is re, you know, healing, uh, the community healing, the ecology, but then also recognizing 
the logic behind that energy use. So why is it always about more at this end so that there's less at this end? And we're only talking about, well, what can people who are being exploited and oppressed do? Rather than questioning, why is it people at this end continuing to need to have such high energy demands? Uh, you know, that um, absolute blasé attitude of taking for granted the right to vehicular mobility in America or and elsewhere, uh, the right to gas guzzling cars and now to electric vehicles, rather than question, can we have an alternative, let's say public transportation? So we do not need so many lithium batteries, uh, so much lithium and coltan mining and so much uh, throwaway culture. So why do we, uh, this goes to your circular economy. Uh, so part of that is a uh, way to confront climate coloniality is if we think about reducing in terms of thinking about how things are connected, in terms of also thinking about degrowth economics and donut economics. People talk about, you know, we have to have a basic floor f below which no one falls and we have to think about what is a good life. What are the ways we can still have well-being without continuing to have increasing exponential amounts of fossil fuel extraction and use, energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, um, and so on. So these are the kinds of conversations that I think we need to have. And it often comes from many people suffering. And we, then we have, a, we have enough of that collective evidence of that, that we see the ongoing continuities of empire at the altars of these rare earth mineral mines, at the fortress conservation that indigenous people are being dispossessed from their lands and the areas are forested off. The same with areas where there's mining occurring, causing you know water contamination and so on. So yes, we do need resources for goods and services, but I think we need to have a much more holistic understanding. And that's what decolonizing climate justice means. It is not just to say climate justice is just to be able to have uh, more solar panels. It is to understand the wider issues at play and recognize that, yes, we may feel helpless in the moment that because there's no one person can solve this, but it is possible to begin a conversation where you are with what you have, with who you know, and uh, read more, expand more, and then start to intervene in, you know, chipping away at these um, behemoths of uh, conglomerates of, of fossil fuel warmongering um, and then hyper intense capitalism and that perpetuates this racial capitalism of exploitation and discard culture. Indeed and of course the book provides great examples practical you also have a, a part in praxis how do we act in order to decolonize and I'm wondering of course this this book is a big contribution to it how do you see your contribution in the future? Or what do you want to see from other researchers to contribute in the future? Uh, yes. Um, so in the book, uh, we I do talk about a range of these that, that you highlighted that I mentioned. Uh, there's a lot more. But in terms of working with communities to, um, you know, recognize that co-production of knowledge, coming up with uh, solutions and, and making those be shared more widely, uh, having um, research that is more accountable. So that is that, you know, theory and practice becoming praxis. So it involves a lot of that ethics of care, prioritizing collective well-being, uh, recognizing that collective flourishing uh, will allow a much better health of both the planet and humanity in the long run. And then also gesturing towards um, ways to stop this um, endless cycles of violence. So how do we think about uh, both the uh, you know, anti-colonial work that's come in the past, but then also decolonial indigenous methodologies that exist? How do we learn from uh, the ways that, how do we learn from communities and ways of knowing about the world that have been silenced? So in terms of really questioning uh, those, one way to think about is planetary mutuality. So if we think about planetary mutuality, how can we uh, think about holding others in our hearts and our minds and in our theories and in our science, but to think about what are the different ways we need to be able to do science and research? 
one of the uh, ways that a lot of people are doing that is to not only engage with like black, indigenous and people of color around the world, but to um, have, for instance, even having reading groups, um, <clears throat> you know, around these issues, whether it's this book or another book to um, enhance the collective knowledge base first and then figuring out who we need to have conversations with. So you don't just go in um, without uh, any understanding and then uh, creating a bigger problem uh, or being uh, very much seen as a savior or as a hindrance. Uh, you know, so those are uh, very problematic. So I think one thing to think about is that we do need to think about that education, training, but also what is in the media. That's an intervention site the way people are portrayed, certain narratives that get replayed over and over again. Um, we can think about also changing, you know, challenging hyper-consumptive lifestyles in terms of starting those conversations and doing more research on what, the, uh, what could we do to reduce um, consumption? What could we do to have more uh, robust so socioecological relationships? Thinking about ocean systems instead of just thinking of oceans as a site to dump and a site to extract from, right? Uh, so thinking about the wider oceanic relationships. Same with forestry. So thinking about the robust you know, biodiversity, but also which includes indigenous communities over time and thinking in terms of thinking relationally. And I think those are things that bring, as an educator and scientist and researcher and speaker, it brings me back to conversations about reading, about reflecting, about deep listening. So we must, so I, you know, I do want to stress this, deep listening is incredibly important. So we must be able to listen for the silences and what was erased, and we must be able to hear we must be able to hear, and then we must be able to collaborate and uh, share those knowledge, because otherwise it remains very confined. So what really excites me uh, about um, this uh, book is that not only did it bring together many different voices from different disciplines and different methodologies at different locations around the globe, but also in terms of the fact that it has generated large number of conversations already. The book goes into much more detail and is much more rich in its explanation in um, giving hope, in giving, um, I guess, uh, strategies in terms of thinking individually, collectively, uh, what do I need to do so that I can do something better? I shouldn't think that I can just run in and fix somebody else's problem, right? Instead of first figuring out what are the ways am I complicit in upholding or participating in or being enrolled in climate coloniality and what are the ways that I can help uh, a wider collective solidarity building to think of ways forward. The book really helps. I do want to stress this and highlight this. Um, for someone who is a novice in these topics and wants to participate or wants to know how they can help or at least listen a bit more, it really helps. So I would really not only put the link in the description of the podcast, but also there are many of the chapters that are open access. So please go ahead and look into them and also use it for your own educational curriculum, as we mentioned. Thanks so much for your time. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm very grateful uh, to be able to speak about the book. And as you mentioned, there are open access chapters. Uh, there's a discount uh, to purchase the book, if you'd like, from the book's website. It is off of my website, which is my name, farhanasultana.com, and then forward slash confronting climate coloniality. Thank you so much. There will definitely be a part two sometime. Uh, I would also highly encourage you to listen to some other episodes we've had uh, that are also mentioned in the book, such as Juan Martinez Allier on injustice and the Atlas of Environmental Injustice. There was Raj Patel on capitalism and how it made nature and our lives cheap. There was Jason Hickel and Julia Steinberger as well. So please have a look at the other episodes. I think you will manage to, to make the links in your brains as well. Thanks so much again, and I'll see you all in the next episode. <laughs>